You asked so many good but challenging questions. I guess maybe to remember that their world is very different from ours. Hey guys, it's Dr. Melanie. Join me for today's expert interview with Dr. Erin Hecht. She is the head of the neuroscience department at Harvard University and is leading the Canine Brain Project. From dog aggression and brain studies to the healing bond between children and dogs. We talked about it all, so enjoy. <laughs> It is such a pleasure having you today here. Thank you for making the time speaking with me. Uh, every time you and I talk, I feel really excited and inspired about, you know, I always ask you what are the research projects that you are doing. I'm really um, excited about what is going on, but also really humbled by all these things we, uh, we don't know and that you know, and that maybe you don't know yet, but will know at some point. So I think um, for all viewers to really excited to dive into dog aggression and dog behavior a little bit more, particularly what you do currently at Harvard. But to give a context for everyone watching right now, tell us a little bit um, about yourself in terms of your research and endeavors, how did your research career evolve, where did it start, and then we'll dive more into what's going on as of right now. Sure, yeah, and first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be able to talk with you. It's always fun to talk with you, and it's um, a pleasure to be able to um, reach out to your listeners as well. Um, so, okay, so how did I get started? Um, so I went to um, grad school for neuroscience. I got my PhD in neuroscience at Emory University and I was working with chimpanzees. So I was doing non-invasive neuroimaging with chimps and I was trying to understand what makes chimpanzee brains different from human brains and sort of how does the chimpanzee mind function. And it was really cool and really exciting, but um, I, I was always fascinated by evolution. Um, and there's so much that's different between chimpanzees and humans, and we are separated by so much evolutionary time that um, sometimes it can be a little bit difficult to answer evolutionary questions um, looking at chimps. And then one day I was sitting on my couch with my dog, um, and this TV show came on, came on that was about uh, foxes and dogs and genetics and behavior and domestication. And I thought, this is amazing and fascinating. And how is it that there is no neuroscience in this TV show? So I thought, this is what I'm going to do. And the next day, I emailed um, the person that directs the um, domesticated fox project in Russia and asked if I could get involved or if I could study their brains. Um, and I emailed. Um, the closest veterinary center to me that had an MRI scanner and asked if there were any scans that I could use um, that from dogs that turned out not to have any neurological problems. So over time, that kind of just grew and snowballed. Um, and then here I am. That is really impressive. And and if I may say ballsy, you just reach out and it's like, hey, you're missing, you're missing the neuroscience part here. I can do that for you with you. <laughs> and then... Well, and I don't know, it might have been a little bit naive, but hey, it worked. Sometimes you just got to be going for it, right? And don't overthink it. <laughs> be naive yeah. enough. <laughs> um, okay, cool. So, new science it is, right? So, the first time we met was almost exactly a year ago at the Canine Science Conference in Hamilton, New York. And, um, you know, canine science, we talk about this as being really multidisciplinary. So there's genetics and there's epigenetics and then there's cognition and psychology and ethology and, of course, neuroscience. So what about neuroscience and whether this is in chimpanzees or dogs or foxes, is it that that intrigues you? So why? Why neuroscience? Ah, Okay, so I, I used to think that I wanted to be an astrophysicist. Um, I was like fascinated by outer space and like what was going on in this world that exists, but we can't really see it. You know, we can just see it a little bit from where we are here on Earth. Um, and I started out in college as a physics major so that I could do that. And then, okay, this, this story is going to take a left turn. I had a work study job that was, um, I was working in the meal hall and I was the person that was assigned to wash the dishes. And it was awful. It was the worst job I've ever had. It was so gross. Um, and so the next semester I took the the very next work, work study job that I could get, which was working in a neuroscience, uh, in a neuroscience lab. 
and I just totally fell in love with it. Yeah, very unexpected too, right? <laughs> yeah, but I think it has like some some parallels that, that there's this whole unknown, unknown world that happens inside of our heads, and so that that's kind of what hooked me in and kind of stole me away from astrophysics, I guess. Yeah. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad that, <laughs> that uh, you're here now and that we can talk about neuroscience. For me, um, and and maybe you see it very, in a very similar light. So for me, neuroscience and, you know, I started out with immunology, which I is very similar in terms of this huge network and who knows what's happening, right? We can see it, but obviously we are alive and we don't, uh, most for the most part, don't get sick and die immediately. So a lot of things happening the same with the brain but for me other than just the fascinating network and this idea of you know if you look back into like 20 years ago or something like this in terms of dog and dog research and experiments it was all very behavior focused meaning what we see is what we get right so we set up an experiment we watch the dog what the dog is doing or the fox or chimpanzee um, and then we more or less draw conclusions from it um, but I feel like Oftentimes, what we see it might not be what we get, or there might be so much more underlying that we don't understand. And I think, to me, neuroscience is, in a way, a discipline that can fill the gaps because now we have potentially newer imaging and we can see what lights up and can connect dots and maybe connect that to behaviors and there might be totally surprising elements of it. So is that, you know, is that something that also you find fascinating or is it something that drives your research in terms of applying neuroscience? Yeah, definitely. Um, so as I'm sure, you know, you and many of your listeners are aware, sometimes behavior can look the same in different animals, but have very different reasons um, for, you know, different animals producing similar behavior. Um, and I think if we can look in the brain, it can tell us something about the biological mechanisms that are producing the behavior. So things that look similar on the surface might actually be different underneath. Um, do, you, do you have an example? Hmm. So actually, oh, you're putting me on the spot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think... Um, so if you just think about like facial expressions or body expressions that dogs, that dogs use to communicate um, how they're feeling, um, you might have a dog that rolls over and shows you its belly because it's really relaxed and it trusts you and it wants belly rubs. Or you might see the same behavior when the dog is actually a little bit uncomfortable and is trying to let you know that it's not a threat and it's trying to appease you and maybe calm the situation down a bit um, and prevent you from aggressing towards it. Um, and like right now, we don't have neuroscience techniques that could figure out what's going in a dog's brain while it's rolling over, <laughs> but maybe someday we will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right now they all have to hold very still in the MRI, so there's no rolling over, I guess. <laughs> okay, yeah, that is very interesting. So basically the hypothesis is, you know, the behavior looks the same, and one dog, the brain areas may be related for fear or fight or flight or whatever, in the extreme case, might light up versus the other one is totally relaxed and has the opposite lighting up in the brain and saying, I want more of this. Uh, that's a very good, I think a very good example because we see a lot of books for dog owners, you know, they learn very diligently the body language of dogs and say, you know, this behavior means this and this behavior means that. But the context plus the personality might actually mean something very, very different. I'm moving now to a little bit more to aggression because I think this is something that is particularly in, uh, interesting for a lot of people. But now with the advancement of neuroscience and having the ability of neuroimaging, something that you do in your lab a lot, um, do you think that either it has already started or will change more so over time um, the perception of aggression in dogs? Meaning we put a label on it, we say it's good, or well, we never say it's good, but not being aggressive is good and being aggressive is bad. Now that we go more into the research, using neuroscience, understanding the whole behavior more so than just saying this dog is aggressive and will bite, do you feel like the perception of aggression has changed, will change or should change in that context? Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure if it's happened yet, if it's changed yet. Um, but I guess one thing that I hope that it might be able to do um, is 
um, help us understand how much of aggression is fear-based. And I think people that work with dogs a lot um, kind of have the feeling that a lot of aggression is fear-based. Um, and that is something that we should be able to see in the brain. Um, there are different circuits in the brain that are involved in fear and flight or fight and self-defense versus um, obtaining a reward um, or hunting. Um, so we should be able to see in the brain um, if a particular dog has a, a brain phenotype that's more biased towards that fear processing or maybe influenced by many fearful events um, versus more biased towards um, acquiring something that it sees as a reward. Um, so I think that might be something that a, lo a lot of people that spend a lot of time thinking about and working with dogs kind of already have top of mind, but maybe the general public doesn't. Um, and I, I wonder how much dog aggression could be prevented if we just saw it as an outcome of fear um, rather than the dog sort of being like a bad dog, quote unquote. Exactly, and how that influences not just the prevention, but potentially also, well, empathy in the way that saying, okay, this is where it's rooted. Um, and, and, you know, given that we can, we can shift from, you know, good or bad, the valence to make an aggression more like it's, it's the process and that has been the end of the process, but so many steps has happened before that led to this. And is there from your understanding being prone to more fear aggression versus more the, the the rewarding or maybe both i can imagine you know sometimes it's both mixed in um do we know about the genetic components of this not yet that's what we're hoping to figure out with our current study um in other animals generally um like i like i mentioned there's different circuits of the brain that are involved in fear processing versus reward processing um and it's pretty well established that there's fear-based aggression and reward-based aggression in, for example, rodents and primates. Um, but surprisingly, it hasn't really been studied and documented scientifically in dogs. Do you think it's because it's harder than obviously having rodents? Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, um, you know, rodents are easier to study in many ways. And there are um, like neuroscientific approaches that people use in rodents that we wouldn't want to use in dogs. Um, and doing neuroimaging or other types of non-invasive work in dogs is really time consuming. So maybe that's why it hasn't happened yet. I think also scientists tend to ignore dogs because they're right under our feet, like they're in our daily lives. And so we don't really think of them like they just, I think we sort of um, accidentally ignore them sometimes. <laughs> accidentally ignore them yeah i can't ignore my cat <laughs> <laughs> but given that you know we accidentally ignore them but we're they're actually now becoming more of a model again for research um we still have a lot of research done in in chimpanzees and monkeys um in rodents so um what are the commonalities in terms of aggression uh between different species I'm saying this because I already know there will be someone say, well, we, we know things in rodents and mice, but um, we might know things in, in monkeys and humans, um, but in dogs might be completely different. But if can we assume or can we say aggression, there are certain areas in the brain that are very conserved, conserved across species. So we know one thing in some species we can assume might be very similar in dogs too. Can we make these parallels or conclusions from what we know already? Yeah, um, so there are brain networks that are involved in social behavior generally that are highly conserved, not just across mammals, but across vertebrates. Um, so it would be incredibly surprising and unusual if those same brain regions were not involved in different types of aggression in dogs. But that being said, different species have different brain organization related to their unique role in the ecosystem that they're in. Um, so for example, dogs are predators um, and some other species that are studied for aggression, like rhesus macaques, are not generally predators. Um, so there are types of aggressive behavior, or what we might call aggressive behavior, related to, to hunting, that dogs show to a much greater degree than some other animals that are not predators. Um, so we would expect some differences in their aggression circuitry for that reason. But then on, on the other hand, you know, given that dogs are uh, re-domesticated, they don't have to hunt for their foods anymore. There's like so much uh, talk about, you know, the relationship between wolves and the dogs, right? And mm -hmm. that could obviously be um, a research 
understanding of what do we know in wolves and i th believe there is there's is some research has happened um and how does it relate to dogs is it more similar than we think or is it actually bigger differences than we than we thought there are yeah i think this is definitely an area where um there's an opportunity for more research one thing that i think is really interesting and might be surprising to people is so we tend to think that dogs are less aggressive than wolves like that domestication must reduce aggression um but wolves are actually less aggressive towards conspecifics than dogs are um so that might be because like in domesticating dogs and sort of taking them outside of the um context of that pack organization that wolves have, we may have sort of broken some of the um, social behaviors that wolves have um, innately, and maybe those are just not as um, prominent in dogs. So knowing how to approach um, an unknown individual or, or an in individual that is known but has something that you want, those might be things that dogs struggle with more than wolves. And in here, maybe um, something that might be very interesting to, to, to talk about or to mention at least is, you know, the whole hierarchy thing, the alpha wolf, the beta wolf and very strict hierarchy versus the dynamics um, for dogs, for domesticated dogs. Yeah, I mean, I think um, this idea of like an alpha wolf and that you have to be the alpha in your household with your dog, I think has been mostly um, sort of let go by the scientific community. And I think even the person that came up with that sort of has has said that he wished that he hadn't proposed that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, I mean, in wolves, the, the social group is other wolves. In dogs, the social group is humans. Um, and uh, wolves mostly um, interact with the members of their own pack um, and members of other packs are, would likely be met with aggression. Whereas dogs have much more, ideally have a much more fluid type of sociality where they can meet strangers and you know not see them as enemies right off the bat. Um, so I, it seems like the types of social situations that dogs have to deal with are probably less predictable and more fluid and more complex possibly than what wolves have to deal with. But I don't know, I, I'm not a wolf researcher, so I, I hesitate to venture too far into that territory. <laughs> That's true. Well, then let's let's stick with, uh, with the whole dog behavior and dog aggression. It's a beautiful segue to, you know, more specifically what you're doing in, in your research um, at Harvard right now. So I know you have a few postdocs and grad students. Can you give me kind of like an, just a high level overview of the different projects that you're working on? And then we'll, we'll dive a little bit more into um, the dog aggression one. Yeah. Um... So uh, one project that we're starting soon is looking at the development of an attachment bond between dogs and kids. So for this project, we'll be scanning both the dog and the kid um, soon after the dog enters the household. And then again, um, six or eight months later. Um, and we're also measuring some hormones that are involved in the stress response and in social bond formation. And the idea is to see how those social hormones and brain organization change over time um, as the bond develops and how the bond could help children and dogs buffer stress in novel, novel situations. So I'm really excited for that one. Um, I think it will be really fun. And then another project that we have going on right now is looking at breed differences in dogs. Um, and how breed differences relate to historical selection for working behaviors like hunting and herding. Um, and then um, how within a breed, um, what differentiates the brains of dogs that are successfully doing these working jobs versus dogs from working lines who have not undergone training. So it'll kind of help us understand what is innately different about like the brain of a border collie versus a Labrador retriever that makes them good at different types of tasks. And then what on top of that innate sort of foundation do you get with training and learning? So that project is, I think, close to being done. We're, we're kind of starting to we're trying to finish up our last recruitment groups. Super cool. I'm I'm personally also very, very interested in that. And I think everyone who does have a working dog <laughs> and uh, does some dog sports or for, for anything, uh, you know, law enforcement, military working dog, the implications are obviously huge there. Do you think that this is, this is the first step into developing a platform where, you know, tools are available, markers, I don't know, genetic markers or some sort of markers that help um, 
filter or identify or define the potential of a working dog you know saying here these these eight cute pups um and then based on what you found this can these are going to be good for certain activities versus this one maybe doesn't have to go through this tedious training and you know being pushed to do things that might not be feasible for that dog yeah absolutely um so this is sort of the foundational study um, one thing I'd love to do next is track litters of working dogs as they're going through training and see if we can identify early predictors of training success in the brain, maybe even before that training success is apparent behaviorally. Um, that type of stuff has been tried in humans um, with some success. So I think um, since dog brains, dog brains are complex, but not quite as complex as human brains. So I feel like it might be a, a bit of an easier task in dogs than it is in people. Let's uh, go straight to the the dog aggression one that, you know, I have uh, talked to you and Julia many, many times uh, before. And how did this come together? And where is this going, <laughs> hopefully? Yeah, um, so this project is being led by Julia Espinoza, who is a postdoc in the lab. Um, and uh, the idea behind the project was to see if we can find neural signatures of different types of aggression in dogs, which, as I mentioned, is something that we can do in basically every other mammal in which it has been looked for. Um, so it seems like there are at least two main sort of subheadings for types of aggression, one being a reactive aggression that's uh, motivated by fear or the perception of threat, and another being proactive aggression that's motivated by the perception of a potential reward that you could get if you use aggression as a tool. Um, so we're trying to see whether um, those two types of aggression can be differentiated in dog brains, um, whether there's anything behaviorally different about those two types of aggression, whether they might be differentially sensitive to early life stress. So if something traumatic happens to a dog early in life, is it more likely, more likely to produce one than the other? Um, and then we're also looking at the potential role of some candidate genes that we think might have an influence on fear and aggression behavior. So this is this is very interesting, right? So if you have this proactive and this uh, reactive aggression and whether you want, like to me, proactive, you know, I can see how territorial aggression is in a way proactive to protect, but still some dogs still not might like the conflict of that proactive aggression, but then there's this subset that is rewarding and and, um, you know, in, in rodent or my studies, we, they even say part of it is almost addictive. Um, they want this, they're seeking, they're putting effort into seeking out this kind of aggression. Now, you know, for, for dog owners who struggle with a dog that has been aggressive or reactive for a very, very long time, um, the first thought might be, I knew it, there's nothing I can do about it. <laughs> My dog is addicted to it. Um, what's the prevalence? How percentage wise can we say is it actually happening? Oh, that's a great question. I feel like I should ask you that question. <laughs> what do you think the prevalence is? I mean, you, you spend a lot more time with these dogs than I do. I, I just see them for a day when they come in for a scan. I do feel that the more, especially if this has happened early on in the dog's life and it might have happened out of fear, um, that that fear kind of naturally becomes less threatening because the dog matures. But, and then this is probably where genetics and predisposition come in, some of that behavior then has been rehearsed so many times that it actually turns into something that is very, very interesting to the dog and very rewarding. But in terms of the prevalence, I think it's happening more often than we think, um, especially for those who have rehearsed that for a very long time. But I, I would never want to put any number on it just to not say, <laughs> give anyone the chance to say, I knew it, I can't do anything about it because I do think there's still a lot that we can do to rehabilitate regardless. And, you know, since we are in that, in that realm of, I don't know, what is really going on? And maybe there's even a fourth or fifth kind of category of aggression. Um, whenever I look more into this, and you know, you probably have that too, you you kind of go on PubMed and you look for um, scientific research or publications and you fall down this rabbit hole of, yes, that has been studied and that has been studied and that has been looked at. The more you look into these things, do you feel like, okay, there's so much more that we don't know? Or do you feel like, we just haven't asked the right questions and maybe it's not as complex as we think it is. 
Hmm, that's a really good question. Um, I think I'm constantly sort of confronted with how much I don't know. I feel like <laughs> just in general in life, the older I get, the more I realize how little I know. Um, but uh, I think when I go down that rabbit hole with looking at the literature, um, I, I feel like what I'm looking for is like, like a little hook or a hint of something that could lead to um, an easy or like a, a clearly interpretable experiment. Um, so like um, this fact that there are different types of aggression which are dissociable in the brains of other mammals that like strongly suggests it should be the case in dogs. So let's just go look. Um, I also think it's really interesting what, interesting what you mentioned about um, having the opportunity to rehearse aggression can be reinforcing and could cause something that is fear motivated at first to become reward motivated over time. I think that's something that's um, substantiated in the rodent literature. Um, and just anecdotally, it seems like something I've seen in dogs. Um, like I think one of my dogs has that issue. Um, <laughs> yeah, and so then that leads me to another thought, you know, um, in the rodent literature, they also look at how to extinguish that type of learned reward aggression. Um, and the things that have been done in rodents involve um, like basically injection of different types of pharmacological agents into specific brain areas. And um, it can work. So, you know, we, but we can't obviously go around injecting our dogs in their brains, but maybe that suggests that there could be a possibility for a pharmacological intervention that hasn't been explored yet in dogs. That kind of information, knowing these kind of things, you know, establishing new behavior modification programs that might take advantage of new pharmaceutical interventions just to get a, a, a start, you know, sometimes it's so hard to get started and, and you know, you can't, you can't take your dog out for a walk because you're already faced with 10 dogs and your dog blows up. Where do you even start, right? Um, having kind of something that helps them start, but also understanding really what's going on, what kind of type of aggression is that to develop more hands-on rehabilitation programs that do help the dog match naturally in the way that you train the dog overcome that behavior and learn better behaviors for this to happen um maybe ideally or in, in your mind what role should science play and i'm saying this very carefully because <laughs> um, there are a lot of people who are very skeptical the setup of these experiments isn't very it's very behavior driven it doesn't really mimic the real world the dog lives in we don't know what to do with this um, to really propel forward, to take everything to the next level. What role do you think science could or should play when it comes to behaviors, dog behavior and rehabilitation of aggression? So the first step of the scientific method is supposed to be observation. Um, and I think that is something that can easily be overlooked, especially when you've got your nose in a book or a computer screen all the time and you're just like, your observation is looking at um, the results of previous studies and like, you know, kind of just sketching everything out on paper as a system of boxes with arrows. Um, really observation should be watching the animals um, or talking to people that have that, that firsthand knowledge and years of experience with the animals. So I think um, science can, I mean, I guess, you know, I'm biased. This is my career. This is what I'm doing with my life. But I think science can produce useful information. But the usefulness of that information and how well it generalizes to the real world sometimes depends on how well the scientists interface with the real world. Um, and I think in, in the canine science world, um, we're kind of in a special place where, like, you know, um, rodent neuroscientists, you know, there were no rodent behavior people that were out observing rodents in the wild. It was all just in the laboratory, but um, there are plenty of professionals that have lots of experience and knowledge about how dog behavior works and how dog minds work that's based off of real world experience. So I think in the canine science world right now, we're in an exciting point where there's this like corpus of real world knowledge that's been developing over decades. And then now the corpus of scientific knowledge is starting to develop. And I think the possibility for interchange between them could be really really fruitful there has been some let's just say misunderstandings of you know how how the dog world really works from a scientific perspective but also vice versa in terms of you know the what role science can play me and my team can decode it we do want to um start or or put into place, bring alive a symposium next year where we do exactly this. We bring in researchers and 
and trainers to have discussions and create, you know, talking points around ongoing research and how that can translate. So it's going to be probably in the fall next year, but I would love to have you there. Oh, um, yeah, and as a representative um, of the science, the real science world for dogs. Speaking of, you know, having our dogs, and this is like one of my last questions, where do you get your inspiration from? Is it from your two dogs, <laughs> Lefty and Izzy, are their names, right? Do you sometimes, and this is what happens to me, um, you know, we all, everyone who has a dog, you know, they, they have their quirky personalities and they, they do something funny and then we sit there and like, what is going on in your brain? Everyone thinks that. But when you think that, <laughs> there's a whole different meaning to it as someone who is leading the canine brain project. So are there inspiration for you? <laughs> do you? Do you do your first round of observations with your own dogs? Absolutely. I mean, who doesn't? Um, yeah, Lefty was sitting next to me on the couch when I was watching that TV show that, you know, didn't have any neuroscience in it. And I just kind of looked at him and I was like, hmm. <laughs> and he was probably like, no, mom. <laughs> but, um, Don't bring uh, me into this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but I think um, like the deeper I get into canine science, the more I realize how little I understand what's going on in their minds. Um, I think, you know, before when I just had dogs that were part of my house, you know, I think we anthropomorphize, anthropomorphize them a lot. It's very easy and, you know, it's fun to like, you know, give them a little human voice and um, talk about what they're thinking sort of from a human perspective. Um, and for the most part, that works pretty well. And, um, you know, you can kind of go about your, your daily life with them in that mode. But then when I started really trying to understand what, what do we know so far about dog minds and dog behavior and what do we not know, I realized how little was really known from a scientific perspective and how different their world might be from mine. Um, and I, I guess that just makes it all that much more tantalizing and fascinating. I completely agree. I think it's worth the effort to to look into, you know, what is going on in the brain. And again, everything happens in the brain anyway. So um, I want to end this uh, with the call to action, if you will, because, you know, Julia's project for the dog aggression is still ongoing. Um, we had many, many amazing owners joining it. There are many different, not many, there are three different rounds for this. So for everyone here, as the, the viewers and listeners who want to participate, why don't you give me or us a very brief um, context in terms of what is happening right now in Julia's project? And, you know, what are you looking for in terms of people who would like to participate either through the survey or the next two rounds, how that looks like? And then I will put the link to the survey in the description of this video so everyone who is interested can click on it and um, help out Aaron and Julia at Harvard with that project. Yeah, that would be great. Um, so the, the study, as you mentioned, has three phases. The first phase is a couple of surveys. The first survey is designed to be super short. So if all you have is 10 minutes, just do that first survey. That would be fantastic. At the end of the first survey, you'll see a link to a second survey, um, which asks for more in-depth information, which is really important, asking for more context and history about your dog. Um, the third phase is a cheek swab, so uh, or the second phase is a cheek swab, so we would just mail you a little kit, same type of kit you get for Embark or, or something, and then you would mail it back to us. Um, and then phase three is MRI scans, which are non-invasive, uh, supervised by expert veterinary staff, and we provide travel support for um, dogs and their people who want to come participate in the MRI scans. So we're especially looking for dogs that um, have had either that have current behavior problems like fear or aggression or reactivity problems um, or that had some kind of traumatic event early in life. Um, is that project, that whole project, is that um, on track? Uh, when when this, when do people get to know more about the results? <laughs> yeah, so Julia is doing a fantastic job. She's already collected over 3,600 survey responses, I think, at the last count. Um, and the preliminary results um, indicate that, you know, this is not a big surprise, but it's an important thing to confirm in a large community-based sample like this. Um, early life uh, stress does indeed um, increase fear and aggression behavior in dogs. Um, so that, that seems to be very clearly shown by this data. Um, and then we're going to have to keep um, analyzing the data to see how reactive aggression and proactive aggression relate to early life stress um, and how they might relate to these candidate genes. 
All right, well, we also will stay tuned here. <laughs> Last but not least, if there's one thing <laughs> you want everyone, whether they have a dog, about to get a dog, had a dog, have multiple dogs, with issues, without issues, if there would be one thing that they would, you would want them to take away from the research, the neuroscience, something, maybe an aha moment that you had, or maybe a little, a little snippet of wisdom that you gained over the years, which is something that carries them through the day is like, okay, that helps them look at their dog a little bit differently. What would that be? You asked so many good, but challenging questions. I guess maybe to remember that their world is very different from ours and the this, this, this situation that we're in together with them might feel very different to us than it does to them. So if their behavior um, is challenging um, or confusing, maybe try to be patient um, and you know keep working and keep, keep seeking expert help um, to try to address it. Um, I think there's a lot of knowledge out there that um, can help dogs like that. I couldn't have said it better. And uh, with that, thank you so much for, for, for coming, Erin. I really enjoyed this. I hope we can do this again very soon. Great. Thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. this was a pleasure.